we are just thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have today's speaker. Um, he's going to be talking about the culmination of the conservative movement in Ronald Reagan and the Reagan administration and the role of ideas in the successful political campaigns of Ronald Reagan and, the, and in the shaping of administration policy and the extent to which Reagan appealed to and made use of principles of traditional conservatism, neoconservatism, and libertarianism. Uh, we're thrilled to have him, and next, next week we're going to be talking about what really happened to set the stage for Ronald Reagan with fusionism and Buckley, and our speaker will be David Keene. But right now, I'd like to introduce the former domestic policy advisor to President Ronald Reagan and the former president of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, who was also formerly served as assistant to the Attorney General, as well as the assistant to the Chief Counselor of President Reagan, T. Kenneth Cribb, Jr., Ken Cribb. Thank you, Mallory. Thank you, Mallory. Uh, we've already discussed earlier today that this uh, is really a groundbreaking course. I congratulate the Citadel and, and Mallory Factor and his allies uh, that have, have pulled it off and to the cadets who have chosen to, to be participate in this uh, exciting inaugural course on Conservatism 101. It's actually uh, fairly appropriate that uh, conservatism receive a course at a major university for the first time in the sense that it did actually take national power and defeat communism just as a throwaway. So uh, uh, yes, it's, it's time that it had a formal study. Our speaker today, Edwin Meese III, he was Ronald Reagan's top assistant both when Reagan was governor of California and when he was president of the United States. He was U.S. Attorney General uh, following that and now holds the Reagan Chair at the Heritage Foundation, perhaps the most influential think tank in the world. Now, now that's a pretty impressive resume. Now I'll tell you why it understates his achievement. So it's appropriate that Ed Meese is here talking with you uh, on a consideration of conservatism. If there is an indispensable man in the conservative intellectual revival, in the conservative movement, it's Ed Meese. He's the glue that holds us together, just as he held the Reagan revolutionaries together in the 80s. He has earned the stature to ask us all to put aside institutional differences, to work for the greater good of the cause of freedom. Oliver Wendell Holmes once wrote that a great man represents a great ganglion in the nerves of society or to bury the figure, a strategic point in the campaign of history. And part of his greatness consists in being there. Ed Meese was there when Ronald Reagan needed an alter ego to make sure that his aggressive policies did not fall victim to politics as usual in California and Washington. Ed Meese was there to lead what has been called the great debate on the original understanding of the Constitution restoring the Constitution once again to its central place as America's fundamental law binding as written. Ed Meese was there to serve as President Reagan's chief policy advisor in masterminding the economic recovery in 1981, producing the largest peacetime economic expansion in history to that date. Ed Meese was there to argue for President Reagan's move from the failed policy of containing communism to the military buildup and strategic maneuvers that forced the Soviet Union to spend itself into bankruptcy. Ed Meese has always walked in lockstep with Ronald Reagan in pursuit of one goal, human freedom. Not freedom in the vulgar sense of license or even merely the freedom to acquire that is sometimes mistaken for the American dream but freedom in an older sense of the word. Freedom to choose the good. Freedom to make one's own way in life, to choose for oneself how to behave honorably toward country and lovingly toward family and friends. It is for that freedom to choose that Ed 
has toiled so mightily and so well and with so little thought for himself. The world is a more hospitable place to that freedom because at a critical juncture in human affairs, Ed Meese was there. The cadets, the 75th Attorney General of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you, uh, particularly to be here at the Citadel. I have, uh, I've been here a couple of times before, uh, but I have never had the privilege of addressing a class, and so it's uh, good to be with all of you and to have this opportunity to uh, join you here, uh, particularly in this particular class and, and this particular series, uh, which has uh, a great meaning to me. Uh, as it does to Ken, as you might imagine, uh, having uh, had considerable opportunity to work in the conservative movement and with the conservatives to uh, have a chance to participate in what is, seems, from what I've uh, read about it, including your syllabus, a uh, really excellent course here on uh, the whole uh, conservative movement and conservative thought. Uh, as you know, and as it's been indicated, this session is uh, entitled the, the Reagan Revolution. And I think it's interesting to note particularly in the military setting here, that this was not a revolution that was achieved by force of arms or by military accomplishment, but rather a, a, a revolution that was accomplished by ideas. And it was indeed a revolution of ideas. And it results really from four different factors coming together. Uh, those four factors are, uh, first of all, a movement. Uh, secondly, a message. Thirdly, a leader and fourth, a crisis. And it was the confluence of those things together that enabled us to have in this country what we now call, in retrospect, uh, the Reagan Revolution. The modern conservative movement uh, in America uh, is really something that is a phenomenon of the last 60 years, essentially since World War II. Uh, Al Regnery, who was here, I believe, for your first lecture, uh, talked to you about this. Uh, and he and those of us who have kind of thought a lot about this and the history of the conservative movement since uh, the end of the war, uh, we uh, look at it in terms of, of three phases. And the first phase, uh, which started immediately after the war, uh, was the intellectual movement, conservatism as an intellectual movement. And it was at that time that many of the scholars uh, on campuses here, as well as uh, in England and some other places, but particularly in America, people like Milton Friedman, Russell Kirk and people such as that, uh, became concerned about the drift towards socialism in the United States and even more so the drift towards socialism around the world. And their, their uh, thinking was, uh, here we have managed to take ourselves out of the threat of, uh, of the Axis powers, Nazism and the Italian and, and Japanese threats, and now we have a new threat which is an intellectual threat to our people as well as uh, potentially uh, even a military threat, although the intellectual threat was much more prominent at that time because we were actually still allies uh, with the Soviet Union at the time. And so uh, the writings uh, that came out uh, th that were fundamental to the movement beginning were people like uh, Milton and, and Russell, and then the writings of people like Friedrich Hayek, uh, Ludwig uh, van Mises, and others. And at that time there was only one real publication in the United States uh, that was a regular conservative publication that was Human Events that had started in the late 40s and which is still going today. And then there was a very important episode in the conservative movement and the entry of a new leader and that was Bill Buckley. I'm happy to hear that you're going to have a session on him and I'll try not to uh, steal the thunder from whoever's going to speak on that. But Bill Buckley was, was a, a very important part of it because unlike the others who were older scholars, uh, he introduced a, a new vigor and a new enthusiasm as a younger man. He had just graduated from Yale. Uh, he had had uh, he was at Yale uh, as a rather uh, later than most of the people because he had been in the army before he went to Yale. But at Yale, <clears throat> he was the the leader of almost everything. He was the chairman of the Yale Daily News, which was the most prominent position on on campus. He'd been active in the political union. He was the chairman of the debating association. Uh, he was literally, in the phrase that you heard, a big man on campus. And, uh, and Bill uh, was a, a real uh, scholar himself. 
And so uh, he had written while he was at Yale, or right after he graduated from Yale, but based upon his experiences at Yale, he wrote the book God and Man at Yale. Uh, you could pick it up today and you would say, gosh, that's what's happening on some of our campuses today. He was very prescient in the sense of de de uh, detecting a drift in the economic field towards socialism, economic and political field towards socialism, and in the religious field uh, towards an anti-religious uh, attitude, way before it was obvious to any of us who were at Yale at the time. Uh, but, uh, and needless to say, his book did not get total uh, agreement with uh, the people running the institution at the time, uh, particularly the faculty. And so, uh, but, but when he, this got him prominence uh, in the country, uh, this book, and particularly in this intellectual community. Uh, and then uh, he did a number of other things that were extremely important. One of the things was that he uh, started National Review, which started around 1955, uh, and again is still going today, which has been the chronicle, if you will, the monthly chronicle of, uh, of uh, the conservative movement, uh, which has engaged a number of uh, top writers and has been able to give on both a, in a current and an historic basis uh, a great deal of information uh, to those who are interested in conservatism. Well, uh, Bill was also very significant in the transition from the intellectual movement, conservatism as an intellectual movement, to conservatism as a political movement. And in 1960, he gathered a group of young conservatives, people who were in college or just out of college, at his home in Sharon, Connecticut. And there they wrote kind of a manifesto of what modern conservatism should be. It was called the Sharon Statement, and many, namely because it was in Sharon that they drafted it. Uh, and this was attended by uh, participants in what was a growing organization of young conservatives called Young Americans for Freedom. And this was, uh, was a very singular event because it went beyond then uh, simply thinking, talking, and writing about conservatism to actually action, political action, uh, in which these people became involved. And of course, uh, not too far, uh, too uh, many years later, 1964, and the years running up to that, uh, Barry Goldwater confirmed the conservative movement as a political movement uh, when he ran for president in 1964. And while he didn't win, you might say that even uh, without winning the presidency, he became one of the most influential figures in the history of conservatism because he recruited a lot of young people uh, for his campaign. He recruited, uh, recruited a lot of others as well. But it was mostly the fact that young people, like those in Young Americans for Freedom, who had a desire for the kinds of qualities that make up conservatism, freedom, opportunity, things such as that. Uh, they had this, this desire for that. And so they saw that in the United States in the campaign of Barry Goldwater uh, for uh, president in that year. And that developed the start of a cadre of conservatives, which has lasted up to the present time. And it was a very important cadre because as these people had worked in the Goldwater campaign, uh, then continued to get together and to work together and to be involved in politics, uh, n n not in one gigantic national organization by any means, but in terms of a lot of small organizations, a lot of small activities. The only national organization was really Young Americans for Freedom, uh, but that they were all active in the conservative movement in their own way, in their own areas. And it was this cadre that was absolutely critical to Ronald Reagan when he ran for the presidency for the first time in, in 1976, which I'll discuss in a few moments. Well, uh, that was the second phase then. The third phase of conservatism in this country uh, was turning conservatism into a governing movement. And that really started with Ronald Reagan in 1967, when he became governor of California. Conservatism was not really talked about much in political circles or in governing circles at that time. There were a lot of other phrases, uh, you know, the New Deal, you'd had the New Deal, you'd had a lot of other uh, movements and so on, the pro progressive movement way back in the early part of the, 19th, uh, of the 20th century in the 1900s. Uh, but uh, there wasn't an awful lot of matching of philosophy with actual governing, uh, in the, particularly from a conservative standpoint. And so that's what Ronald Reagan did as governor. 
uh, he inherited a government in California which was virtually bankrupt. His predecessor had, through an accounting trick, had changed from, uh, from uh, uh, one form of accounting to another and in the course of that was able to spend 15 months of, of revenue in 12 months of actual activity. So the first thing that Ronald Reagan faced uh, was literally a, a half-empty treasury uh, without enough money to, to uh, last out uh, the fiscal year without bar bargaining, uh, borrowing. And in California, as in almost all states, you can't have deficit spending. And so he was forced in his first year in office to raise taxes. Now for a person who had campaigned as a conservative and talked about the importance of keeping government within its budget uh, to discover that you now have to raise taxes uh, was a terrible blow. But Ronald Reagan, true to his conservative ideals, uh, told the people that he was going to, as he said, cut, squeeze, and trim the government. And if he was able to cut enough out of the government to get it back within its revenues, he would return all the additional taxes that were not needed. In other words, he would not allow the tax increase just to keep on and allow that to be a basis for government growing. And indeed he did. He had three different uh, tax rebates to the, to the people of California during the course of his eight years in office. So uh, it was, uh, w the reason he, he was able to cut, squeeze, and trim, by the way, was uh, he recruited from the top businesses in California 250 of their top executives, brought them in for six months into the state government, had them go into every corner, uh, every department, every agency, and come up with economies. The people who came from the phone company, for example, at that time the Pacific Telephone Company, they found out how the state government could cut down, uh, could uh, more efficiently utilize their telephone system uh, and organize their telephone system and save a lot of money, even though it cost the telephone company revenue. Uh, they were very happy to do this in the interest of all the people of the state. And that went right through. Other businesses, too, in their particular field of specialty were able to recommend uh, fleet management, all kinds of things, printing, uh, recommend all kinds of, of economies. One that I've always thought was kind of interesting uh, was that in the end of 1967, his first year in office, they mailed out some three months early the uh, automobile license renewals. And the press was all over and said, you know, this governor doesn't know what he's doing. They're not due until next March. Why is he mailing them out then? Well, uh, what his people had discovered, our finance department had discovered, was there's going to be an increase in the, in the postage in January. And so by mailing these things out, even though it was very early, uh, we saved literally uh, thousands of dollars uh, of postage uh, when you consider the number of people in California. I think it was about 28 million at the time. Uh, and so you figure out the number of cars, uh, that, that's a lot of stamp money. So, uh, but it was those kinds of things. And the way, reason I say he started the governing movement is he proved that conservative ideas make sense and that they actually work in practice. And that's why this was such an important part of launching this new phase of conservatism, and that was the fact that these ideas really worked out in practice. The second major factor that I want to talk about is the message. And the message really is one that was derived from the best classical liberal and conservative thinking throughout history. And you know about that because as I read the syllabus, uh, you've been doing a lot of that study. I was impressed uh, with uh, in looking at it with the, the idea that these strains of thought uh, could be kind of focused on the four cities, Jerusalem, Athens, uh, uh, Rome, and, and London. Uh, but it, the idea, at least as, an, as a way of kind of showing how these ideas develop uh, in history. But it also included things like, uh, the message includes things like what we learned from the Magna Carta, uh, probably one of the most critical documents uh, as far as what then later went on uh, in what became the United States. English common law, uh, Blackstone and others writing about that. And of course the, the key ingredient that went through all of these kinds of ideas was this idea of freedom and the idea of individuals uh, having responsibility. And then of course uh, the early writing of the founders, uh, the work of, of Tocqueville and others. All of this uh, is part of the message that was part of conservatism uh, as it came uh, to be integrated into uh, what we now call the Reagan Revolution. Ideas, in other words, were very important. And uh, there were several idea clusters at the time. Uh, one of the things that is remarkable uh, that we'll uh, talk about in the course of these remarks is the way in which differing ideas 
or differing ideas about conservatism uh, were brought together into a comprehensive philosophy and a comprehensive strategy. Uh, George Nash, who's one of the authors that you've been reading uh, in, in the book, Reappraising the Right, uh, talks about uh, the conservative movement that came to power with Ronald Reagan. And he talks about it in terms of having five parts, five different, I would call them idea clusters uh, that came together. Uh, one was the classical liberals and the libertarians. And these were the people uh, who were very much concerned about the threat of a powerful, overpowerful, if you will, government. And the idea of the welfare state and how this would be a threat to individual liberty as well as to free enterprise. And that was one, one group. Another were what you might call the traditionalist and what George called the traditionalist conservatives. And they were worried about the, the fact that the ethical norms and the institutional foundations of American life were being weakened essentially at the hands of what were called uh, secular and relativistic liberals. Uh, and it's sort of harking back to, to what Bill Buckley had talked about in God and Man at Yale. A third group uh, were the anti-communist cold warriors. These are the people who were convinced that our country was increasingly imperiled uh, by uh, Marxism and particularly by the Soviet Union. A, f a fourth group is what we call, uh, we call still today, uh, the neoconservatives. Thank you. And the neoconservatives, of course, are those people that uh, Nash had an interesting uh, phrase for it. He said, uh, they were liberals mugged by reality. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that pretty well, uh, uh, I think, captures it. People who had liberal ideas, and in some ways, and I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, Ronald Reagan was kind of one of these. Uh, and uh, they were because they saw that liberalism wasn't working, uh, they were gravitating towards something else. They probably wouldn't have admitted themselves that it was conservatism, but they were moving in that direction. And of course, one of the things that the Ronald Reagan revolution did was give them a place where they could now be respectable uh, as neoconservatives. And then the fifth group uh, was the, was the, uh, the group, uh, and that was the, uh, the religious right, a people who were more interested in the moral aspects of the way the country was going, uh, people who had been concerned about the, the uh, cultural wars of the 1960s and 1970s uh, and who were worried th about that from a moral and religious standpoint. So it was a matter of uh, bringing all five of these strains together uh, as a part of getting the message across. Now, Ronald Reagan uh, was a, a man of ideas. Uh, he had read extensively uh, he had thought deeply about history and political philosophy, and so he was able to bring these varied intellectual and political strains together into a comprehensive conservative message. Uh, George Nash described this as what he called a grand coalition. And so that was how we, there was a message, a philosophical foundation, if you will, to go along with the movement that I described earlier. Well, the third factor, of course, was a leader, a leader. Uh, you cannot have a movement without a leader, at least not one that's going to be successful. Uh, professor Rufus Fears, who's a very uh, uh, insightful uh, professor at the University of Oklahoma, has written a lot about leadership, going all the way back to the Greeks and Romans. Uh, and he describes the fact that the difference uh, is in order for a person to be a statesman, rather than a mere politician, is to have four qualities, four characteristics. One is a, a bedrock of principle. Uh, secondly, a moral compass. Third, a vision of where that leader wants to go or thinks that the country or organization should go. And fourth, the ability to communicate that vision and gain adherence. Well, Ronald Reagan, uh, as a leader, had all of these qualities. Uh, as a bedrock of principles, his principles really were the same principles as the founders when he came to the presidency and even as governor. Uh, principles such as uh, free enterprise, belief in free enterprise, individual freedom, uh, a belief in the importance of limited government, those kinds of, of principles which characterized his governing uh, as both in both the state of California and in the United States. His, his moral compass uh, was clear. He was a man of great integrity a man of great courage, both physical and moral courage, and also 
uh, a man of great perseverance. Once he had set his goals, he would, he would not give up. He would continue to, to work for them. He had a vision. He had a vision of where the country ought to be going. And it was a vision in, ter in terms of returning to the basic principles and ideas of the founders, a, particularly a vision of the economics uh, and the economic uh, policies of the country, a vision of how a good president could govern and particularly govern in accordance with that key sentence in the Declaration of Independence, which says that the only legitimate government is one that governs with the consent of the governed. And so this was a part of his vision of where America ought to be going. He also had a vision, by the way, in regard to the great threat that we had at the time, and that was the whole threat of communism and particularly the Soviet Union. And then uh, his fourth area, of course, was a unique ability to communicate uh, that vision and to gain the support of the people of the United States. Uh, there's one uh, uh, kind of interesting uh, uh, anecdote about that. Uh, his first speech to the people was from the Oval Office. It was shortly after he had taken office and he was going to describe his economic program. And so he had a uh, by, by, he was sitting at his desk, and right behind the desk he had a chart, a whiteboard, something like that one over there. And he was going to draw a graph. And so in the afternoon he was practicing, and he had the two of these, uh, these uh, pens, uh, these uh, markers. And so he drew the graph in one color, and then he, then he showed uh, how the, uh, what was going to happen to the, to the budget or the deficit if there was no, uh, if there was no change in the, in the economy. Uh, and so he showed that with one line, one black line, and then he had a red line, and he showed how the economy would improve and uh, overcome the deficit uh, if we had a tax rate reduction, which is one of his proposals. That's what he was selling to the American people at the time. Well, uh, when he finished practicing that, went back to his speech, forgot to put the caps on the pens. Well, you who've used those things know what happened. That night, he gets up, and he's in the middle of the speech, and he says, I think I'll show you exactly what I mean. And he goes up there, and of course, by that time, they dried out, and so the pens didn't work. And so he, so, but he didn't lose a beat. He put them back. He said, well, no, I think I'm going to tell you something else, and I'll go back to that later. Meanwhile, one of our staffers was crawling on the floor <laughs> below the television cameras down and putting two new pens up there, <laughs> at which time, uh, after he'd crawled back, uh, the president says, uh, but I think now's the time that I want to show you what this means, <laughs> and, and it goes back and it all worked. Well, uh, what I say, uh, he, had, uh, he had these qualities of communication, which are, uh, I think, second to none among the presidents uh, in our history. Well, how did Ronald Reagan get there? Uh, how did he get to be the kind of a leader that he showed when he was president? Uh, I would suggest to you that uh, his leadership experiences were not unlike what you all are going through at the present time. Uh, I see by the collar insignia here that we've got a lot of leaders in the room uh, and that that's a natural part of what you're doing. It actually was for Ronald Reagan, as I'll mention. Uh, but he had been a leader most of his life. He'd been a, uh, president of his class in high school, president of the student body when, his, when he was in college, actually was a leader in the Army. Uh, in, the, in the 1930s, he enlisted in the Army as a private in the Army Reserve because uh, he wanted to ride horses. And so he, he joined a cavalry troop. Uh, at uh, Fort Des Moines, Iowa, while he was a sportscaster there. Uh, he wanted to ride, but he had no money and figured the best way to do that would be to ride uh, as a, a soldier in, in reserve. Uh, but he wasn't content just with being a, a regular a soldier and working his way up through the non-commissioned ranks. He took the special co correspondence courses to become a second lieutenant. So when World War II broke out, uh, he had a reserve commission as a second lieutenant and uh, was called to active duty. Uh, and did serve, uh, ultimately rising to, uh, and was a captain by the time he left uh, active duty in, at the end of World War II. But uh, the Army provided him with the kind of formal leadership training and, and experience that he wouldn't have had otherwise. And so it was a very important part of this life of a potential leader of the country. And uh, in, you might say uh, uh, enhanced his natural leadership ca uh, capabilities with the kind of information that you all are learning in your, in your military science courses. Well, uh, an interesting thing about Ronald Reagan, that's what I meant when I was referring to the, to the neocons, the neoconservatives. Uh, in his early life, his early adult life, he was a liberal. He was a self-proclaimed liberal. He even said on one occasion that he was a bleeding heart liberal. And I think it was derived from his strong religious background. His mother was extremely religious. She was the kind of lady that would literally visit the jails, taking food to the prisoners, 
uh, helping out neighbors and all that sort of thing. And he and kind of uh, followed in that in that track uh, as a young man, young boy, particularly a young man. And I think he was in, inspired by this idea, uh, religious idea, that everyone should be his brother's keeper. Uh, it took a while uh, for him to realize that when government is involved, far from helping you uh, help your brother's that be your brother's keeper, that government often uh, when it strayed outside its own realm, was more likely to be uh, your brother's master and yours as well. And so uh, that was a change in his approach to government and to politics that took place uh, really after, uh, uh, probably around the 1950s or so. Now, before that time, however, and probably one of the things that started him thinking about this, uh, he was the president of the Screen Actors Guild during the late 40s. Now, the Screen Actors Guild is the union uh, of all the actors. And it's one of several unions in Hollywood. They have a union for the cameramen, union for the stage managers, a union for the grips and other people who help out in the movies, and so on. And so he was among these various union leaders. He was the leader of the Screen Actors Guild at a time when the Communist Party USA, the internal Communist Party in this country, tried to take over the unions as a means of taking over the movie industry and they wanted to use movies for propaganda purposes. And so they literally were trying to take over each of these unions. Ronald Reagan led the other union leaders in resisting the communists, literally kicking them out uh, in a very bitter uh, war, actually, which did involve guns uh, and uh, uh, tear gas and other things uh, and uh, some really uh, very strenuous activity uh, to uh, where uh, they had strikes and, and all kinds of uh, real major problems during that period of time. Uh, but that was where he got his idea of the threat of communism, his vision of communism, and how to overcome the communists uh, as, he, as he was able to at that time. Well, uh, that education was extremely important because he not only started thinking and reading about communism uh, as an internal threat, but also reading about communism in an international and worldwide sense. It just happens that the lawyer for the union, for the Screen Actors Guild, a friend of his, had been a, was an avid reader and writer on international communism. And he would provide books like The Treaty Trap and other things to, uh, to uh, Ronald Reagan. And he would, would devour this information and read it. And, and uh, so he got quite an education at that point. And so I think that may have been part of the starting point uh, for him to change some of the views that had occupied his mind up to then. Uh, as you uh, may may know uh, from history, uh, a good many of the people who were in Hollywood uh, were seduced by the communist propaganda and actually became part of the communist movement at that time. Some of them got out of it later, uh, but it was a it was a, a big uh, issue there uh, for uh, Hollywood during that period of time. Well, in the 1950s, uh, Ronald Reagan was the host of a program, very popular program called the GE Theater, the General Electric Theater. Every Sunday night, it was live. And he would be the host. Sometimes he'd play one of the characters in the, in the uh, episodes that they showed there. And part of his contract was that he would go around during the week to the General Electric plants. They had a big program of political education for their employees. And so they provided them with uh, informational material. But they also had him go around. Being a, a movie star, he starred by that time in 51 movies. And being a star on television now, uh, he was quite popular. People came out during their lunch hour in the various plants to see him. Over the course of 10 years, he visited 137 GE plants. And it was during that period of time that he talked with the workers about what their problems were. He talked with the managers, he talked the supervisors about what their problems were. And then he also read a lot of the material that they were passing out. And so he started to have, again, uh, from a more formal way, to learn about uh, communism, about uh, socialism, about the free enterprise system and the threats to the free enterprise system. And so that was a very important part of his education as well. And I think finished the job of turning him from a liberal uh, to a conservative. Now, one of the things that happened was uh, he started as a result, he was, became a very popular speaker. And so he was often asked to make, after he'd made these talks to the workers, people who heard him there would invite him back to Rotary Clubs or Kiwanis Clubs, Service Clubs, that sort of thing to give talks on free enterprise. And so uh, uh, that was, uh, uh, w and then pretty soon uh, political figures, particularly uh, conservative uh, political figures, would ask him to, to speak on their behalf. And so in 1962, 
uh, he was uh, speaking, and uh, in the course of his, his speech, he remarked that he had been a lifelong Democrat, but now he was favoring this particular Republican candidate. And so during the question period, one of the ladies in the back of the room raised her hand and said, uh, Mr. Reagan, uh, you sound more like a Republican than you do a Democrat. And he said, well, I, I guess my views have, have really gone in that direction. He says, uh, you know, I probably one of these days, if I find a registrar, I'll re-register. The lady said, I'm a registrar, and I'll see you after the meeting. <laughs> and so, so that's how he became a Republican. Uh, now, it, it, it's, it's hard to overstate the extent of Ronald Reagan's intellectual preparation for governing, uh, although he did, probably didn't realize it at the time. But all of that reading that he did, and he had a, a wide uh, variety of things that he read. He read Bastiat's The Law, for example. He read Hayek's uh, The Road to Serfdom. Uh, he, read, he was fascinated with Whitaker Chambers' book, uh, Witness, in which Whitaker Chambers uh, talked about how he was, uh, was uh, uh, more or less drawn into communism and then how communism had failed. As a matter of fact, uh, he even memorized parts of Whitaker Chambers' book, uh, which he felt were particularly significant, and we would use those in his speeches, uh, speaking by heart. He also started regularly reading human events and also National Review, so he was up to date on the latest literature uh, of the conservative movement. And so that was, was really a very important part of his preparation. But he had a particular interest in the history, the early history of this country, the founding, and he was just tremendously impressed by the, by the biographies of the figures that were involved, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, all the rest, and also what they did and how they thought, uh, particularly in terms of their altruism, how their willingness to put aside personal interests or even the interests of the states that they represented in order to get to put together and to create uh, a single nation, a united nation, a United States of America. Uh, you all remember in your history books how they had to nail shut the, rut, the uh, shutters on the windows of the building in Philadelphia so that the news media, even at that time, uh, they had a little problem with the news media so they wouldn't overhear what they were saying inside because many of them were not necessarily just espousing what the people in their states wanted to hear but were giving their own views about how we could have, in fact, bringing all the 13 states together into a single na nation. And so uh, he, that really uh, interested him a great deal. He was fascinated by the Declaration of Independence, uh, how that was really the, the creed, if you will, of freedom for our country, uh, and particularly how the Constitution came to be, uh, as in that uh, uh, Independence Hall in uh, 1787. Now, it was this that, uh, that uh, was in his background when in 1964 he was asked, uh, having been a fairly prominent speaker in California at least, he was asked by a group of businessmen that if they would raise the money for a national telecast of him speaking on behalf of, of Barry Goldwater in the Goldwater campaign, uh, would he do it? And he agreed to do it. And so uh, they did raise the money themselves so it wasn't out of the campaign coffers of Goldwater and they put him on television. Well, he gave the speech entitled A Time for Choosing where he explained the forces of liberalism versus the forces of conservatism and what this meant to the people of the country and that we had to choose one way or the other and what would happen if we chose to give up the freedom and the principles of the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution and instead went towards a larger, more centralized, more powerful government uh, and towards uh, what was the liberal dire direction that was being advocated by a number of the people at the time. And so uh, this made such a hit that these businessmen saw uh, what an ability he had, first of all, to promulgate a vision in line with what I had mentioned earlier and to gain adherence, that they asked him if he would run for governor of California. Well, Ronald Reagan said, they don't want an actor for governor. And, uh, uh, and the men said, well, you're more than an actor. He said, well, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will take six months and I'll tra travel around California and talk to groups and if there's any reaction of people being supportive of me running for governor then I'll, I'll entertain it. Well he did that and just to show that he wasn't just an actor spouting lines that somebody else had written, what he did was he would talk for about ten minutes and then he would go for an hour and they could let, have them ask any questions they wanted about California government or what he planned to do, these kinds of things so that it wasn't 
so that they could tell for sure he was not just an actor, that he had some, some thought behind these things. And so that's, that's what he did for, for about six months. Uh, he flew around the country, uh, flew around California. Uh, the interesting uh, part of that is he had never flown before. Uh, he hated to fly, and so he'd always travel by train. Even when he went on, around the country for General Electric, part of his contract was he could always travel by train. That's why it took a week to get to some of these plants. But in any event, uh, he finally had to give up and fly in the airplane, but he managed. And uh, so he, he went around and, and got a tremendous response from the people of California, and that's how he ran for governor in 1966 against a very popular incumbent governor who was running for his third term. Uh, he won. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, 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 his opponent, uh, Governor Pat Brown, uh, was overjoyed overjoyed to hear that Ronald Reagan was his opponent because, he, as he said, uh, uh, I can beat an actor, certainly. Uh, as a matter of fact, he even had a, a rather nasty ad which, where he had a little girl and somebody was talking, a teacher was talking to a little girl and said, you know, it was an actor that shot Lincoln. Uh, well, uh, well, that, uh, well, that kind of promoted a, 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 a reaction that was not too favorable by the people. Probably helped Ronald Reagan more than it did Pat Brown. In any event, uh, Pat Brown uh, was defeated by nearly a million votes in 1966, and that started Ronald Reagan on his uh, political career. Uh, he was, uh, did an outstanding job as governor. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about uh, what he did with the, with the deficit, uh, erasing the deficit, uh, putting into place sound fiscal policies. Uh, it was a period of, of a great deal of stress because that was the, the uh, late 60s and early 70s with the Vietnam War, the demonstrations, the uh, disorders on campuses, all that sort of thing. And he was able to handle that with uh, good planning, with good preparation, with personal involvement in, in uh, talking to people, uh, including talking to students. Uh, and uh, one of them was uh, he had a meeting of all the student body presidents of all the colleges in California there in the capital. And uh, so he was explaining uh, the importance of the, f of the foundations, the philosophical and, and political foundations of the country, the principles of freedom, the principles of individual responsibility, those kinds of things. So one of the student body presidents raised his hand and says, uh, Governor, can I ask you a question? And uh, the governor says, sure. And uh, the student body president said, well, Governor, how do you expect us to adopt these kinds of ideas? Or how do you expect to understand what our thinking is? You know, we didn't have television. We didn't have coast to coast air travel. Uh, we didn't have people going to the moon. Uh, we didn't have any of these things. Uh, um, uh, rather, you didn't have any of these things. You and your generation, how can your generation understand us if you didn't have television, moon travel, transportation, all the rest? And Ronald Reagan said, no, my generation didn't have them. We invented them. So, well, uh, he had that ability to really take any question and pretty well turn it back on the people, or at least answer it in a way that started them thinking. Well, this made him uh, actually a national political figure as a result of what he was doing as governor of California, both the product but also the, the talks that he was giving. He was asked to speak, and he had a platform to speak out on a nationwide basis as a champion of conservative ideas, a champion of the founding principles, and he talked a lot about the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the example of the early leaders that he had studied so carefully in his early days. Well, uh, this led him then when he left the presidency in, uh, or the governorship in, in 1975, January of 1975, there was quite a groundswell that he ought to run for president in 1976, even though uh, G Gerald Ford, our president at that time, was going to run for re-election. And uh, Ronald Reagan was uncertain whether he ought to do it, but what this made him decide to run for re-election, even against an incumbent president of his own party, was he was dissatisfied with two things. One was the way in which the government had grown and was continuing to grow. And number two, the fact that we were not being tough enough in dealing with the Soviet Union. We were engaged in detente, what was called detente. In other words, the two in sort of an equilibrium. But what was happening is he knew from his own studies that the Soviet Union was cheating on this idea of detente, and they were moving ahead in their direction and towards their objectives while we were standing still and, in effect, letting them do it. And so it was these two things uh, that, uh, that caused him uh, to uh, run for president against uh, President Ford. Now, uh, he, of course, did not win. 
he came pretty close. He got all the way to the convention, uh, and, uh, but he didn't win. Uh, and in many ways, it was probably a good thing he didn't, uh, because I'm not sure that the country was ready for his ideas in 1976, as much so as they would be in 1980. But in any event, uh, he, uh, he, he, uh, he did challenge him, and in the course of that, he enlarged this cadre that I talked about that started with Goldwater because the people who had worked in his campaign continued as strong politi political activists, conservative activists. And so uh, this enlarged really the group of people that were part of uh, the conservative movement, particularly those who were interested in the political aspects of the movement. And so that was an important factor in moving the conservative uh, ideals and, conservative of, and of the body of conservative people along. It's interesting, I think, to talk a little bit about his personal qualities and characteristics. Because as has been mentioned in several books, uh, somebody measured, I believe, recently that there were over 11,000 books written about Ronald Reagan, both in this country and elsewhere. Uh, but the question is, how does one man, we've had you know, uh, a number of presidents, we've had 44 presidents, uh, how does one person stand out so much that even now, uh, more than uh, 22 years after he left office, he's still the president most talked about of any former president, uh, even more so perhaps uh, uh, than uh, the most more recent presidents. Uh, and I think part of it was his personal qualities and characteristics. Uh, I often get a question when I talk to groups, what was Ronald Reagan really like? What was he like as a person? And I always answer that his most significant characteristic was his optimism and his cheerfulness. Uh, he was... Uh, he was always upbeat. As he would say, he believed the glass was half full rather than half empty. And he, he kind of exuded that and, and uh, invigorated others by his own optimism. And as a result, he was able to inspire a team of people to do things that they didn't realize that when they started out that they were going to be able to do. And so he was literally uh, an inspirational leader as well as an intellectual leader uh, and a very good managerial leader. And he, uh, he uh, also had, and this was a very important part of his, his whole way of getting along with people and, and inspiring people, he had a great sense of humor, described by uh, many of his uh, people who wrote about him uh, as a legendary sense of humor. And I always got, usually get asked the question, well, what's my favorite Ronald Reagan story? Uh, I heard a lot of them in the course of the 30 years I had the privilege of working with him. I uh, heard a lot of them many times, as a matter of fact. But he had stories about Hollywood, and he had stories about jokes and all this sort of thing. Uh, and, uh, but my favorite is one that he told so many times. It was uh, entitled, uh, The Central Intelligence Agency and an Irishman. And as he told this story uh, back in the days when the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, uh, was causing, they had the troubles. You remember when they were fighting against the British in Northern Ireland? And uh, they, they had come, several of their agents had come to this country to seek people of Irish ancestry to raise money. So the CIA decided they better find out what was going on over there. So they uh, decided they would uh, send an, an agent uh, into deep cover uh, to find out what was going on. And they had a, an agent by the name of Murphy. They thought that was a pretty good name for somebody going to Ireland. And so they uh, bring Murphy in and say, Murphy, you're, you're going to go into deep cover. Now, deep cover means what? No radio. Don't take a radio with you. Radio emissions would be, give you away. No telephone calls to the United States. No contact with headquarters whatsoever. And when we need your information, we'll send a courier over there to debrief you. And just so you know that the courier is authentic, there's a password. A few people have uh, gone to spy movies. You know, you always have to have a password. So the password was, "'Tis a fair day today, but tomorrow will be lovelier." They figured that you could work that into a conversation pretty easily. So off Murphy goes. A few months pass, and they decide it's time to debrief him, so they dispatch the courier. The courier is not quite sure where, they, where to find him. He's supposed to be in this little village. So he starts there and looking for an Irishman, he starts at the local pub. And so he goes in, he orders a, a, a whiskey. He was a very good agent, you know. If he'd ordered a martini, he would have given himself away. So he orders a whiskey and engages the bartender in conversation. And uh, they talk about the crops, they talk about the weather. And then he just says casually, he says, by the way, I'm looking for a man named Murphy. Well, the bartender says, we've got a lot of Murphys around here. There's Murphy the bootmaker, he's got a little shop across the way. There's Murphy the farmer. He's got a place two miles down that way. And I just happen to have, be named Murphy also. Agent sips his drink and says, uh, It's a fair day today, but tomorrow will be lowlier. 
Oh, says the bartender, you want Murphy the spy. He lives around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, uh, that was typical Ronald Reagan. The last factor I want to talk about, and that is crisis. Uh, you remember Rahm Emanuel, if you've been following the, the current administration, remember Rahm Emanuel said, never waste a good crisis. Uh, in other words, that a president has more power to do things or more ability to do things if there is a crisis. Well, Ronald Reagan uh, was, was sworn into office at the height of the greatest crisis we had had in several ways, uh, certainly the greatest, greatest economic crisis we had had since the Great Depression of the 1930s. We had inflation in those days of 12.5%. We had interest rates of 21%. Uh, compare that with today when interest rates are barely 2%. Inflation is about the same. Uh, we had an energy shortage. I can remember getting up uh, early in the morning to get my car 5.30. You had to get your car in line at the local gas station because by 8.30 they would have sold all the gas they had for that day. So we had a, a real problem there. Uh, we had, uh, w the country uh, was really, uh, had an unemployment situation which was extremely serious. Uh, it was not, uh, it actually got up at, at one point up as high as 10%. That was in terms of the economy. We likewise had a great crisis in terms of foreign affairs and national security. For one thing, uh, there was the threat of communism and particularly the Soviet Union, which was a real threat because their potential for aggression was great. Uh, they they uh, had uh, actually just in two, two years before the end of 1979, they'd marched with impunity into Afghanistan. Uh, likewise, uh, they were, ha using uh, Cuban troops in Angola to subvert the government of Angola. They had uh, a Marxist bastion in our own hemisphere in Nicaragua, and they were subverting El Salvador and their neighbor, and we were trying to take over the government of El Salvador. Uh, so we had all of these things, plus the fact that Ronald Reagan was very disturbed about the captive nations. A good portion of Eastern and Central Europe was under the, the, the heel, if you will, of the communists of the Soviet Union, and there was great oppression of the people there. Uh, such as in, uh, in Poland and, and various other countries uh, where the people were literally under martial law and under military dictatorships. That was one problem as far as a threat to the country. A second major problem was that our military capability had deteriorated from the end of the, of the Vietnam War, 1973-74 in that period, so that we were uh, at one of the weakest points we'd been, certainly the weakest point since World War II. As they said at the time, we had planes that couldn't fly, uh, for lack of spare parts. We had ships that couldn't sail for lack of trained crews. We had army tanks and uh, artillery pieces that couldn't maneuver for lack of either ammunition uh, or, or fuel. And so our military situation was extremely dire. The third uh, part of that threat to national security uh, was our position of world leadership. Uh, we were no longer as respected as we had traditionally been uh, since the end of World War II. The pundits were saying that capitalism had peaked and that democracy was as, as wide as it was ever going to go, and that the wave of the future was socialism. They looked at what was happening actually in Africa, in Asia, even in Latin America, and uh, they were predicting that we would be moving more in a socialist and in a less democratic direction. And also there were many people who engaged in what we call moral equivalence, and that was that freedom and democracy and totalitarianism were just two different ways of operating countries, that there was no moral difference between them. Well, this is, these were things that Ronald Reagan uh, absolutely uh, despised, uh, that kind of thinking. And then, of course, the third major problem that we had as a country was the spirit of the American people. It was described uh, that people, in, because of the economic problems, because of the military uh, uh, lack of capability because of the other kinds of problems that I mentioned, the people felt that America's days were not yet uh, the best to be ahead, but rather that we were in a declining position as a country. They lost self-confidence in the country, in themselves, and in, their inst and in our institutions. Well, uh, obviously with all of these problems, you might say the time was right for a conservative leader with a conservative message to mobilize the conservative movement and undertake what we now call the Reagan Revolution. Well, when Ronald Reagan took office, uh, he started from the guiding principles that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they came from the conservative message itself. They came from the American political experience, particularly the founding. And they consisted lead, really about uh, perhaps uh, six major 
ideas. One, the importance of constitutionalism and the rule of law, following what the Constitution said, obeying the Constitution. Uh, secondly, preserving individual liberty, the freedom of the people. Third, limited government, keeping government within the bounds such as the founders had in mind when they wrote uh, the Article I, uh, Section 8, in which they said there are enumerated powers for the federal government and beyond that they should not go. Uh, another principle was free market economics, uh, particularly important uh, in terms of dealing with the, with the economic problems. Traditional American values, uh, our emphasis as a country on things like religion and family as the moral foundations of the nation. And finally, a strong national defense. So these were the principles. And from these principles came the policies and actions of his administration. His first act, for example, even before he left uh, the, the Capitol, after being sworn in, was to go to a little room there and sign an order, at first executive order, abolishing the price controls, which had been hobbling our, our uh, energy, uh, our energy uh, resources. Uh, beyond that, he did a number of things. In terms of the economic problems, he had uh, got through Congress tax rate reductions. When he took office, the marginal tax rates were 70 percent. He cut those uh, way down. Uh, ultimately to 28 percent as the highest uh, uh, rate and of course he had tax rate reductions across the board he didn't believe in this class warfare idea he felt everybody should be treated uh, equally no matter what their taxes happened to be also regulatory reform uh, discarding unnecessary and burdensome regu regulations that were stifling business and industry he worked with the fed federal reserve for a stable monetary supply he slowed the growth of federal spending. As a matter of fact, for the eight years that he was president, you had the slowest uh, increase in federal spending of any president uh, since World War II. In the terms of the military, uh, he rebuilt our military. Uh, he uh, increased, uh, we had an all-volunteer military. Uh, some of you may know the history of that. And it was in jeopardy, actually, in 1980. Uh, he increased the pay, Im improved the, uh, the uh, budget, imp uh, improved the living conditions of our personnel, uh, gave a lot of emphasis to personnel matters in the military, and showing pride in our uh, men and women in the armed forces. Uh, he also uh, rebuilt uh, and expanded our strategic weaponry. He expanded our, uh, our uh, conventional weapons, particularly modernizing our tanks and artillery pieces and ships, uh, worked towards building a 600-ship navy, uh, worked also on our intelligence system, uh, as well as working on our industrial mobilization capabilities and particularly started something that was very important to him and that was finding a a means of defense against strategic nuclear weapons and that was why he started work towards the strategic defense initiative which was an anti-ballistic missile program which of course is still going today uh, he also uh, revised our approach to the Soviet Union uh, he took on the Soviets on a moral plane he said that people who live by oppressing others that are not, uh, are, as he called it, the epitome of evil in the world. He called the Soviet Union an evil empire. And it was a very interesting because a lot of the New York Times and other pundits thought that was just terrible, provocative, and so on. A lot of the people in the, what I call the striped pants set at the State Department were quite upset. Ronald Reagan said, look, they know they're evil. The people that they're oppressing know they're evil. Why don't we admit that they're evil? And so uh, that, was, that was a very key thing that he did which started to give hope to the people behind the Iron Curtain that there was an American president who not only knew what the situation was, but was going to say it as it actually was. And then also, he let it be known through ambassadors that we would not stand for any further aggression, and that if they tried to move into any other countries, we would join the other nations of the West to take action against them. And then he went beyond that and worked with freedom fighters in Angola, uh, in Nicaragua, in Poland and elsewhere to roll back the aggression that the Soviets had already engaged in. He also reestablished our position of world leadership, working with Margaret Thatcher particularly, uh, so that once again we were respected by the other countries. Uh, and also uh, he uh, revived the, the spirit of America through his talks to them uh, on television and otherwise, uh, saying that our best days are yet ahead, uh, and really revived uh, that can-do spirit. The other thing that he did was very important in terms of the principle of the Constitution and the rule of law. And that is the fact that he took great pains to admit, state the importance that judges should not rule on the basis of politics or their own ideas, 
but that they should rule on the basis of what the Constitution says and what the laws passed by Congress actually say and not act like legislators or Constitution writers themselves. This had been quite an issue because the courts had strayed far from a constitutionally fidelity, faithful path uh, from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And so his appointment of judges was extremely important. And not only his important appointment of judges, but his espousing the importance of sticking to the Constitution and following the Constitution, which was uh, not only the basis for, for uh, selecting judges, but as a means of moving us back towards a more constitutional republic, which he was very much uh, involved in himself and also provided the inspiration for the rest of us. Ken mentioned that in his kind introduction, uh, but that was one of the tenets of our work in the Justice Department was to move in a constitutional direction and to assist the president in finding judges who would be faithful to the Constitution. Well, uh, that really uh, in the, is kind of a, a summary, if you will, of how uh, the president was able uh, to provide the leadership for the Reagan revolution. Uh, a lot of attention was paid to personnel, the people who were appointed. He paid a lot of attention to it himself because he knew that personnel is policy. The kind of people you appoint, what their philosophy is, what their beliefs are, it's going to indicate what they're going to do. Uh, secondly, he had the idea that we should be a team. Uh, people may have differences, but once he had made a decision, he expected everybody to be part of the team uh, carrying out and implementing uh, those decisions. He spent a lot of time uh, personally in the policy-making business. Uh, he didn't allow people to come in and get a quick decision out of him, him in the Oval Office. Uh, he felt that everybody, he used the cabinet, the uh, 18 of us who were members of the cabinet, as his primary forum for decision-making. And he felt that way he would get a lot of different points of view, a lot of different ideas. And he always said, if I, the more information I get, the better job I do of making decisions. And so he used that as a part of the team building, but also as a very important source of his decision making. And he also spent a lot of time with the military. He visited military posts to show the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and Coast Guardsmen that he had a personal interest in them. And that went a long ways uh, towards instilling their morale and instilling in their enthusiasm for the work they were doing. He also uh, recognized conservatives, and this was an important part. Other presidents, some had given short shrift to the conservatives. Uh, they didn't think that they were very important. Uh, he th let conservatives, uh, people in the conservative movement, know that he was one of them and that he appreciated what they were doing. He did this in a lot of ways. There's a conservative political action conference each year. Uh, we had one uh, just a few weeks ago. And he, every, uh, for each of the eight years that he was president, he attended and, or gave a speech by uh, television uh, to that conference so that the, these several thousand conservatives would know that he wanted them uh, to let to understand that he was there's a supporter of theirs uh, and that he was that what they were doing was important likewise he he uh, awarded the medal of freedom and other uh, presidential awards to conservative leaders uh, for what they had done in terms of their service to the country and finally uh, a lot of what he did uh, to get his points of view across but also to show that conservatism works that conservatism was something that people could embrace, and that was through his speeches to the country. His speeches, as I mentioned earlier, he had this ability to communicate his vision, but his speeches were very inspirational to the country, and that was a big part of how he was able to succeed. In short, uh, what he did was, I think, best described by George Nash when in his book, Reappraising the Right, when he said, he transmuted American conservatism from theory to practice, he gave conservatives a successful presidency to defend and a statesman, a statesman to honor and shifted the paradigm of political discourse for at least a generation. We now know it will be probably more than a generation. It will probably be many generations of which you all are a part. Thank you.